It's time for the Myth Wits. That's right. We're back from our summer break, our mid-season, uh, our mid-season break. So this is our our mid-season premiere. This is the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity. Yep, and still coated with sarcasm. Every week we bring on an industry guest to talk about the ever-expanding geekoverse and to play a game with us. We got a good game tonight. It's you guys are going to hate me. Uh, we do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me this week is my co-host, Mike Kafis. Hey, I'm on a show. Hey. <laughs> Honorary Mythwit, Jay Libby. And our guest tonight is Scott Edelman. Hey, Scott. Hey, glad Welcome to be to here. So Scott Edelman has published nearly 100 short stories in magazines and anthologies, his collection of zombie fiction, What Will Come After, was a finalist for the Bram Stoker Award and the Shirley Jackson Memorial Award. His uh, sci-fi short fiction has been collected in What We Still Talk About and his most recent collection, Liars, Fakers, and the Dead Who Eat Them, as a fantastic title, by the way, was published in 2017. He worked as an assistant editor for Marvel Comics in the 70s, writing everything from display copy for superhero Slurpee Cups to the famous bullpen... Uh, bulletins page. He edited Foom and wrote trade paperbacks. In 1976, he went freelance to work for both Marvel and DC. His scripts appeared in Captain Marvel, Masters of Kung Fu, Omega the Unknown, Time War, Pals of Mystery, Wheeled Terrors. My f I love this. Welcome back, Carter yeah. and others. Back, <laughs> he's he's worked I was a for sweat hog. <laughs> he has worked for the Sci-Fi Channel as editor of Science Fiction Weekly, as um, Sci-Fi Wire, and Blaster. That's no E in that. That's Blaster. Uh, he was the founding editor of Science Fiction and edited uh, Sci-Fi Magazine, Sci-Fi Universe, and Sci-Fi Flicks. Scott has been a full-time. Now, after all that, do we have any more time for anything else? Or almost, I'm almost done. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this week. We'll see you next hey, week. See it's you next not time. our fault you're so successful. <laughs> now, pay Scott, attention. Scott has been a four-time Hugo Award. I ain't cut this down, too. Finalist <laughs> Best Editor has been a Bram Stroke Award finalist eight times. Always a bride, but always a bridesmaid, but never the bride in the category of short and long fiction. That's it. I'm done. That's your spiel. Thanks, everybody. No, <laughs> hey, Scott. Thanks welcome to the next week. See you next right. week. <laughs> oh, oh whew, that's a long bio. Now, Scott, as, as you know, I would, Scott has done a lot of stuff, so um, and, you know I can't even believe you did. You buried the lead. You 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 didn't the even lead. print the lead. the lead. You interviewed George Carlin. Yeah. I did when I was a teenager. I did do that. I, I know. know that that should be first and foremost in front of everything else. <laughs> it was, it did, was just amazing back then. Yeah. What did you interview George Carlin for? Well, I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn. That's how I got into comics in the first place. But a friend of mine and I learned that he was going to be at the Bitter End. It's a club that I think is still in New York. And I showed up with a tape recorder. And uh, he had a routine where he sang a song about the uh, Raisin Bran guys. You know, the little raisins. He would, I don't know how well you know George Carlin. Yes, yeah, you know, I love George yeah, Carlin. weird routine where just in the middle of his comedy routine, he'd start going, it's raisins that make post raisin brands are raisin he is raisin you know that whole song oh, anyway right. so some friends of mine and i showed up with a dozen boxes of raisin brands at the bitter end and a tape recorder and we brought it as a gift that we sat there through his whole routine he invited us backstage and we said can we interview you so uh we interviewed him and about 25 years later i found the tape of us 15 year old kids interviewing george carlin and put it up on youtube so it's up there uh, for everyone to listen to. But we just, you know, asked him whether he get in trouble, did he ever get censored, did the people he make fun of, uh, uh, you know, come after him, did anyone sue him, All, you know, what's a joke, what's not a joke. So it was just amazing to be uh, back there. Because this is after he went all acidy. Remember, he was a yeah. straight-laced guy in a suit and short hair, and then a couple of years later, he was a hippy-dippy weatherman. So we were just <laughs> astonished by that. You know, he had the long hair and the big beard and everything, so... Uh, to be a 15-year-old kid backstage at the bitter end and have this guy waste his time talking to us kids. It was just uh, amazing. We were just, you could, if you listen to us, you hear how giddy we are. I did. I, I listened to it. I had a, I had a ball. It was, I was like literally living through it. Pete, it reminded me of when you and I interviewed Scott Sigler. Remember, okay. like, when the first time we did that, we were just so giddy. We were just like, so, so like, what's it like being you? You know, you know, like, yeah, when you're right. you, but you're not you. You're not doing you. What are, yeah. what are you, you know, what are you right. doing when you're not right. you? <laughs> right. Or or the time we, we 
didn't really interview. We hung out, but we kind of interviewed uh, James Randi, and it wasn't recorded. Oh uh, yeah, that was that was one. that was a good time. That was really cool. That oh, was, speaking uh, of James Randi, if we want a segue to talk about Marvel Comics, remember when Yuri Geller met Daredevil? I don't know if what? you remember that. No, yes, I yes. did. Oh, please tell us this. There's one. an issue where Yuri Geller met Daredevil. So one day, Yuri Geller, he's the guy who said, "I have these mental powers. I could bring right. keys to my mind and everything." And he was up at the office. He was talking about appearing in an episode of Daredevil. And my wife, who also worked at Marvel Comics, happened to be hanging around. And they said, "Can we have your key for a minute?" And she handed him her bathroom key. Of course, back then they were all locked, and he took the key, rubbed his hands together, and all of a sudden the key was all bent. And <laughs> I have that key as a souvenir. Oh, I nice. actually, I have. I, well, I'm not quite sure where it is that I can reach for it, but uh, so he was up in the office, and now uh, there's an issue with Daredevil. You could see read Yuri Geller meets Daredevil, and it explains how my wife and I were there, and how I have that uh, key. That's a strange segue to get into Marvel Comics from the amazing Randy, the Yuri Geller. The, no, but we awesome. expect but, nothing less from a Renaissance man like yourself. But, yeah, but That's anything true. can happen when you're hanging around the Marvel Comics bullpen. You, you really yeah. never know what uh, yeah. exactly is going to go down when you're working there. So it was certainly an amazing place to be in the 70s when the lunatics ran the asylum before the corporations really took over, when comics were getting published that no one talked about before they were written and inked and out there, uh, it was just an amazing time to be. So I don't know what you want to know. If you, re if you read Sean's How Sean Howe's book, I'll put in the plug for his book about what a crazy time it was. I think it's called what, Marvel Unleashed. I'm terrible. I'm not remembering the exact name of the book. But Sean Howe interviewed several hundred people, wrote a book about Marvel in the 60s and 70s, and it really was a, a wild and crazy place to be. Hmm. I don't no, know the was, comics is quite the same anymore now that the corporations have taken over and no. they have uh, you know retreats where you plan what's going to happen for the next two years. Back then, no one knew what happened until it was published. Even the editor didn't know sometimes. Well, I don't know. You know, I got to say, uh, you look at the stories that were written back then and and the stories that are written today, and and it just it has a whole different. I mean, it's a, I mean, no, we're in a different time, but it has a whole different feel to it. I mean, like, yeah. all right, so Jay, Jay, you're you're our resident comic like consumer expert like what what is your take on on like the difference between comics then and today like from a from a fan standpoint i mean you look at if you look at captain marvel is a great example so captain marvel was a war war character from back in the day and then when they transferred him over to like uh was a avengers earth's mightiest heroes you know he he wasn't like the character he was in the comics and even when they try to revamp him they're like well he's a scientist now he's not a he's not a war hero and it's like well that kind of defeats the purpose of what Captain Marvel is. He's a war hero who realized that you know humanity has you know has purpose and that the creation should conquer the earth. Yeah, or let's Adam, not kill him after all. Yeah. yeah, or Adam or Adam Warlock. You know, started out as as the the Jesus hippie of the seventies, and then became <laughs> this became this manic depressant. You know, you know I have to like figure out my future when he realizes what it is. I mean, think about it. When you realize, when you find out that you kill yourself in order to save the galaxy, yet you have to live through your life to go through. Adam Warlock tastes nothing like that. I mean, even in the comic books, he's he's weak compared to, you know, the the classic. And in the '90s, they they try to touch base with that a little bit. And even Silver Surfer, when Galactus takes away his guilt, or Galact Galactus gives him back his humanity, and the Surfer almost drowns in his own blood of all the people he's killed. You know through Galactus, and he's like, I was wrong, I need, I shouldn't have my humanity because of all the horrible things I've done in the past. You know, you don't have good stuff like that anymore. Now it's all about, oh, let's be, let's be, like, in your face. And it's like, well, classic Marvel was about the storytelling aspect of, look what's going on in the world without being thrown in your face, like the obvious Hollywood, oh, look, it's that, instead of just, right. hey, look, look what's kind of going on. Are you really paying attention to the story? So Yeah. And I feel like there's, you know, I feel like Marvel always did social commentary, and they were always sort of ahead of the curve, social, like with social status. Um, but today, it seems like it's it's a little, I don't know, it's different. It's different because it's hard to explain because I, you know, it it 
the, it seems like um, the message is beating you over the head now, whereas before it was just integral to the story. Like it was just it was just there. Like it wasn't like like look at my look at what I'm talking about. Look at look at this issue that I'm focusing on. Whereas before it was just it was in there. You know, like mutants were uh, mutants were discriminated against in a, in a second class society, and um, uh, but and, and it and it was talked about, but it wasn't like over the top the way it wasn't. Well, I guess I don't. Know, I guess sometimes it was kind of the main focus. I don't. Know, it's it's, I, I don't know, it's hard for me to explain. It's it's. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, you look at the drug stories that they did back then. Both Marvel and DC did their oh, drugs are bad, drugs are nasty story. One happened in Green Arrow, Green Lantern, where Speedy gets hooked on heroin, and <laughs> the other one happens in Spider Man, where Osborn uh, pops pills and falls off a roof or something like that. Both companies right. agreed they were going to do it, and they were drug focused issues. Um, I don't know if you know the story about that, that um, DC got extremely mad at, uh, at Marvel over it because they were both going to do them at the same time, and Stan went ahead and jumped the gun <laughs> on the Spider-Man one. And if I remember correctly, you go back and look, and Stan actually published that issue without the comics code. It was going to be a thing like, let's convince the comics code to allow us. I believe that was, I have to go back and look at my issue, but I know there was some bad blood about, hey, we were supposed to do it together, not you know, Marvel jumping ahead of DC. Peter Parker also got uh, he got uh, touched in the wrong way in one episode. They were, I heard that it, right. it 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 went south. It was it didn't go the way they thought it was going to go to f try and be more of a PSA. It was more of a not. Do you remember <laughs> that? Ah, uh, that I think that may have been after my time. That was that more of an '80s 80, thing. Yeah, I want to say like '84, '82, '84. Wasn't yeah. wasn't that Power Pack that did that though? What they not touched sure. Spider Man. No, they talked about, oh. about sexual abuse of minors. <laughs> I don't, no, no, well, I, yeah. I may, they may have. There, there, was a, there was a big promo thing about that. It was like, I remember the advertisement in some of the old comic books, I want to say mid-80s or whatever, where that was like, where Power Pack was going to be promoting this, this message. I don't, you know what, they may have. I do know, I know what Mike's talking about, though, and, and they, mm -hmm. they had mentioned it. And that wasn't a big part of, of Peter Parker's life. Like, it, it just kind of came, it kind of was like a hit and run. They never seemed to talk about it again. Like, they, yeah. they brought it up. No, no, I'm just saying, like, as a story, they just brought it up, and then, whoop, it's like, it never happened. Okay. But, uh, All right, so if, we're going to put Peter Parker on the side for yeah, a second. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. I, have a, I have a question, because, and, and you all, I am not the biggest, and I, you know, Regrets aside, not the biggest comic reader, uh, except for my Bongo Simpsons comics. I was big on that. <laughs> um, that said, um, and I, but I do love the uh, you know, Marvel Cinematic Universe, and I, I really am into the superhero stuff. But question about reading comics these days and reading comics before, kind of like you were saying, it makes me want to ask, did you have to think more about the plot and about what was going to happen before or is it now that you have to do more thinking, or is it? Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm I'm presenting this to you guys. You may have a better comparison. Well, it's difficult for me to talk about what people think now because I haven't written any comics since the early '80s. I mean, my whole period of comics went from 1974 to let's say 1982, so I can't speak to the way things are done now. But from the outside of it, as I was saying earlier, with yeah. retreats and editorial oversight instead of before, you. I don't know what a guy like Steve Gerber would do today. <laughs> you know, the man thing and Howard the Duck. And uh, I mean, we knew there was a Howard the Duck because the artwork came in and it was all drawn already and it was in the comic book. It wasn't, oh, gee, go to the editor and say, I have this idea for Howard the Duck. It just happened. Uh, you know, and so much that happened back there happened because the artist and the writer just did stuff. Wait, so and, are, are you saying that, they, that there was. Instead of it all coming from like top down, there was there was some bottom up that the the artists and the writers just just did things and put put comics out. Well, there are often things that the editor didn't know happened until Jim Shooter came in. Once Jim Shooter came in and started uh, putting a tight rein on what was going on, that was one of the things. Uh, somewhere I have a memo about that. That Jim Shooter basically said, "Look, no plot goes to an artist without someone in the office reading it first and approving it." Or cause <laughs> so I. Uh, I Hey, I remember going even higher up than that. The way uh, was it? Uh, Stan Lee was at a uh, at a toy fair or something like that, and was surprised that they gave Iron Man a nose. Remember that? Oh, oh yeah, remember that, that, break, that brief yes. period of time when they oh, decided to give yeah. Iron Man a nose. And yeah, like yeah. Most mock things that ever happened, but and he basically insisted, look, we can't be making these bizarre changes, or that. Oh wait, 
I mean, Rhodey is now Iron Man now, Tony Stark now Iron Man, whatever is going on. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, there were, things were happening and all the boys, the people at the top didn't necessarily, uh, you know, know it. So that would be happening with Jim Starlin, would be happening with Steve Gerber, because I guess there was this trust that people weren't going to go totally off the rails. So they had that freedom. So something like Howard the Duck just appeared. Nice. And that's when you found out about what like, what did he crawl out of a jar of peanut butter if I'm remembering the origin of Howard the Duck correctly. <laughs> oh, that's God. the first moment we see him. And he uh, got so a movie. manifest. You know, <laughs> that. So yeah, so these days when I hear what's going on where everybody sits and plots out what the next year is going to be instead of people going, I don't know what to do next. Okay, I know what I'll just do this or that or the other. Uh somehow I sense the you know, the freedom isn't there. Uh, I mean, I mean, look at it this way. I was there at Marvel Comics. I was hired when I was 19 years old. Who gives that much power to kids? <laughs> right. You know, uh, my, the Scarecrow, my, the uh, Dead of Night number 11 was published in 1975 when I was 20. Uh, I was writing the Bullpen Bulletin's page again when I, everything but Stan's soapbox. Stan wrote the soapbox himself, handed it to me, and I wrote all the other stuff. Everything not in the yellow box. Who lets a 20-year-old do that? Uh, they just have, okay, write whatever you want, and you, you sound like Stan Lee when you want to, so go ahead and do it. So there was just a <laughs> tremendous amount of power handed to when I think back was essentially kids. There was no corporation insisting you do it this, that, or the other way. I mean, I was, again, 20 years old. I came up with all the programming for the first Marvel comic book convention <laughs> in 1975. So there was so mm. much going on back there where, you know, me and, uh, you know, Roger Slifer, Roger Stern, I mean, we were kids, but I don't know if it was that the people who ran the company said, oh, kids know best how to make comics for kids, so we'll leave them alone, and as long as they don't do anything too stupid, we'll just let them do it. Um, <laughs> but that's basically what it was like. Every once in a while, I look back astounded at that. So I, so I imagine that's, that's probably where some of the, uh, some of the stuff that, that gets criticized today may have come from is, is people making decisions without, you know, without talking it over with other people. Like, and they say, well, how could they have done that in the comic back then? It's so crazy. And it's just like, well, I let a 19-year-old make a decision without talking to anyone else about it. They just wrote some it. Some of that. And, you know, my, my very first credit, if you go back and look at it, I think it was Giant Size Defenders number five. And the plot credit for that has about... 15 names on it, I think, because we all went out to dinner at a local diner and threw out ideas, and then I think Steve Gerber put them all together, and that became uh, the story. So, so much of that happened because, oh, we're playing poker one night. Oh, you know, like the issue I did of Omega the Unknown, you were mentioning Omega the Unknown, I did because there was a deadline that was not being met. So, Jim Shooter said, okay, you two, come out to dinner. We're going to go have dinner. And we'll decide, you're going to write one issue, you're going to write the other issue. And on the spot, who do you want to write about? Which artist do you want? Uh, it was Lee Elias or Jim Mooney. And I chose Jim Mooney because he was a, spy, a Supergirl artist when I was a kid. So I loved him. But that was all just happened because we're hanging around at the office one day. Cool. So there was none of this <laughs> planning. It was as if we're juggling chainsaws. And <laughs> if I don't do the next right thing, I'm going to drop it on my foot. So no basically, pressure. there was this attempt, uh, you know, just to keep the train running and not running off the tracks. I remember I would, one of my jobs there was to proofread the comic book artwork. I sat there with the original artwork and a blue pencil, making sure there were no typos, making sure the, the webbing under Spider-Man's armpit was drawn correctly. And I remember John Reporton uh, back then, who was uh, an inker and artist who eventually became the production manager, came in ripped an issue out of my hands, and I said, well, I haven't had time to proofread this yet. And he said, you'll read it when it comes out. <laughs> nice. Because, because that is how late we were. That is how chaotic <sighs> it was. That is why Bill Mantlo, uh, the co-creator of Rocket Raccoon, uh, wrote so many fill-in issues because all the creators were so late that he, they were creating. They didn't want to miss deadlines. We talk about missing deadlines. They had a issue all drawn out of canon. Well, not, well, it's in canon, but out of sequence. Just some story that happened that doesn't mess up what's going on. Mm -hmm. Sitting for every single comic book that was being published at the mm. time, just in case someone was late. And then they all had uh, to be used. What uh, made them so late? People taking on more books than they could handle. People uh, 
you know, hey. artists who were could not draw as quickly as they thought they could. I mean, basically, if you're living off of a page rate, you'll say, yeah, I'll write that book too, or I'll draw right. that book too. And so, there were certain people who were who were slow, and they just had to have them. So if you if you go through that period of the '70s and see, oh, there's an issue by the regular writer, and then there's an issue by Bill Mantlo, and then the issue by the regular writer, you know, somebody screwed up somewhere <laughs> for them to use that. It was meant to be insurance. But what would happen is the minute one was done as insurance, the writer and artist would slow down. Saying, oh, we, don't have to worry <laughs> we have some time. You know what? So no thing was done. It didn't help at all. I bet you could go back. I, I bet if I went back and looked, I might see that there's a, there's an X Men that always stood out, and it was Kitty Pride tells her fairy tale, uh, yeah. where she had like um, the, it was a story with the the dragon and and uh, Nightcrawler was like a pirate or something, uh, and it was just like this one off weird thing where she told a fairy tale to uh, to somebody. You remember that one, Jay? No, I. I, I think a, that might have been a Claremont. I'm, I, I see what you're getting at. That if it was something that seemed like a standalone, it might have been that. Oh, but, it uh, totally was. Yeah. It had nothing to do with anything. It just came out of nowhere. I mean, it was cool. It was a cool comic, but it came out of nowhere. So look, hey, before we go too much further, Captain Marvel. Okay, so you worked on Captain Marvel, and Jay, uh -huh. Jay has. Uh, go ahead and hold up your, your issues. Jay is a is a avid, rabid Captain Marvel okay. fan, um, but I have to admit, I don't know hardly anything about Captain Marvel. I'll tell you what I know. I know there's a whole bunch of Captain Marvels. And I know when I tried to look it up on Wikipedia, uh, and in, the, in the, Marvel, now, I think. the Marvel Wiki, I'm like, oh my God, there's so many Captain Marvels. And like, I, so somebody, somebody please explain to me, where did Captain Marvel come from? Why are there like 50 of them? Is Brie Larson, which Captain Marvel is she playing? Because she seems to be like crossing over and playing the, the original and the Carol Day. I, I don't know. Help me. Somebody. Help me, Obi-Wan. Oh, boy. Well, I can't talk to what came after, but Carol Danvers was there from the beginning just as a civilian. Right. Uh, so she is quite, I mean, she was there in that first, it was in Marvel Super Heroes number 12, if I'm remembering correctly. I hope I'm remembering the correct uh, issue number that was in. And then, anyway, she was always there. But uh, basically, the Captain Marvel I did is the one that was reinvented by Gil Kane and Roy Thomas. And that's what brought Rick Jones into it. That basically made him similar to the old Captain Marvel who said Shazam. I guess Roy always had this nostalgia thing going. Uh, so basically, he had uh, Rick Jones, who was the Hulk sidekick in the old days, find these right. wristbands. And when he would slam them together, he would switch places with Captain Marvel in the negative zone. Uh, I ended up ending that in Captain Marvel number 50 and separating uh, the two of them. But as to what right came... Here. Yeah, there, that's <laughs> Captain Marvel number 50, Wait, yes. Let Captain me see. Hold up. Hold up. I'm sorry, Jay. I didn't have that on you. Hold it up. Okay. Yeah, because right. that, that was... And that was only, I believe, the second issue of Captain Marvel that I ever had to write. So that was really tough. You know, to take over a book on episode 49 and numbers with zeros at the end, you know, 50s and hundreds are supposed to be really important things. So I said, oh, I've got to do something. So uh, I separated the two of them. I had all the Avengers in there. And I created a character who will be in the Captain Marvel movie next year. Is it, is it, is it going to be Death Grip? No, it will not be Death Grip. Oh. No, it will not be Death Grip. If you open, yeah, if you have Captain Marvel, if you take that out of the bag, it's, it's Dr. Minerva who was introduced in Captain Marvel number 50. I was stunned. You know how writers are very egotistical, so they have Google <laughs> alerts for themselves. So every time that man gets mentioned, they get email. Yes. Well, one day I'm getting all these emails. Why am I getting emails all of a sudden? It was uh, Gemma Chan, who is an actress on the TV show Humans, had been cast as Dr. Minerva, co-created by Scott Edelman and Al Milgram. Uh, so they, I, I imagine what they decided is that now that Captain Marvel, I can't take you through all the Captain Marvels, now that Carol Danvers is Captain Marvel and Captain Marvel is a woman, my presumption is they say we need the female villain. If we're going to have her beating the crap out of somebody back and forth, it should be a female. So that, okay. yes, the one that you're holding up there. So Gemma Chan has been cast as that. And it was a very bizarre feeling when she tweeted a photograph of the chair with her name on it to say, you mean when I was 20 years old, I created this character that is giving work in Hollywood to this mm. woman in 2018. 
it is just bizarre to even contemplate that. But so when that's Captain amazing. Marvel com that's cool. comes out on, I guess, March 9th, 2019, I think March 8th or 9th, something like yeah. that. So that would be uh, the first character I had anything to do with that will go into another form. Of course, she did appear in a video game. And she did appear in the game, who I'm embarrassed to say, I cannot remember the name of the one with the pop click things where the, it's at the bottom and you twist them, you know, those, uh, it's sort of like little miniature figurines and you're playing a game by turning oh, it. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Pop clicks, hero clicks, hero clicks, hero clicks, right, right, yeah. She was one of those also uh, several years ago. So that is the first character. I don't know why no one is doing my welcome back collar stuff. What can I say? But, uh, <laughs> But so that may be the first time. There's no guarantee, but they seem Marvel seems to be good about giving credit to the people who are involved. That will be the first time. And let's give a thanks to at the end of, of the movie next year. So that's fantastic. I, I'm just thrilled. I always thought it might be the scarecrow. To tell you the truth, I, I know the people who create these things from the old days know as little as anybody else. But I kept hearing rumors that the villain in the second Doctor Strange movie was going to be Nightmare. As right. you may or may not remember, after, long after I left that character, it became connected with Nightmare when he formed the Fear Lords. It was a group of four weird villains who banded together to battle Doctor Strange. And once I heard that Nightmare might be, I think Variety said it or something, but it doesn't, I don't know whether it'll happen or not. I thought, oh, maybe they'll actually use that character, who eventually they decide to call Straw Man. Uh, uh, but no, okay. Dr. Minerva is the one who, who wins the day there. Okay. So, so, so Jay, I, wait a minute. Hold, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. I, I got the one question for the chat room. I'm wondering, David was wondering, uh, Scott, is, is there a reboot that you would like to see happen modern day? Other than obviously, you know, Captain Marvel, but it's, that's happening. Well, you know, there's a re reboot that is actually happening that I have not read yet that I want to have happen. That you probably know what it is. It's bringing back the Fantastic Four. Which... Whoa. What happened? I'm oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, hey, Scott. You. Scott, I accidentally muted you. I'm sorry. Can you unmute yourself? I, my, my bad. My apologies. Uh, it was I clicked on something. Because you don't like Fantastic Four. That's why. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was. Jeez. Gosh, Pete. I'm. I would. I'm sorry. I got five things running. I typed on the wrong thing. Oh no, we oh, lost. No, him. no, no. no. It, it's it's up here. It's up in your your top. Uh, the microphone with the little line through it. I am so sorry. I can't unmute you. I can I can mute you, but I can't unmute you. It was it was a key. I hit a key. I'm sorry. Well, you don't good have a good God mode. No, I I don't know what's going on. Oh frig! What happened? Can I unmute him? No. No, no one can unmute him, Mike. He can unmute him. Oh, what the hell? <sighs> uh, uh, Scott, if you can see, it's up in the it's up in the top in the middle. There should be a little bar up there. It's got a little person and then like a microphone with a line through it. Oh no! Come on, this is ridiculous. Hold on, look, I'm on it. No, it's not. It's not showing up, dude. It's sort of, kind of. Hopefully he sees it. He said he doesn't see it. Uh-oh. Uh, right and there? I can't click on him. I don't know what the hell's going on. Ah, uh, maybe he needs to just bounce out and bounce back in with the same link. Hey, yes. Oh, fuck. I hate, I hate Hangouts. I hate it. I hate it. All and right, I can't click on, on, I can't click on his picture. Calm so I can't down. see what he's doing. Can you read that, Mike? Uh, no, because it's like really small in my window. Yeah, well, can you can you make your window bigger? Because I can't. No, like he's been, his entire window's been muted, or I can't yeah. even click on it. I don't know what the hell's going on. I'm sorry, Scott. We can't, I can't see. Hold on. Fuck. I hate Hangouts. I hate it. I hate it. I really do. I see. I see. Can't. Click. He says he sees it, but he can't click it. Oh well. Hold on. Um. Welcome to Tech Time with the Tuckwits. Oh, and now he's gone. Yeah, he'll he'll jump back in. Okay, so folks, I'm really sorry. I, I was I was trying to Mike. I was trying to type a note to you. In the oh. in the Google Doc, 
and it was stuck on the stupid freaking hangout. There we go. Am I back? Yeah, yeah you. sorry. You're back. <laughs> sorry, Scott. I'm so sorry. It, I, it was red, and I would click and click and click, and nothing yeah, would I'm happen. It was sorry. so red. Hey, no hey welcome to live. Welcome to live TV. Uh, all right. So anyway, the Fantastic Four. Nothing. I started talking about the Fantastic I, I, yeah, Four. Yeah, Pete hates the Fantastic Four. That's God. why he hated you, dude. <laughs> you, dude. <laughs> no, it is not. It is not. Scott, please, yes, please yes. enlighten us on the on the on the Fantastic Four. Well, I, well, it, well. You know, the Fantastic Four has not been published as a comic because of the whole Sony and all this stuff. And oh, we don't have the rights to it. Why should we make money? Why should we publish a comic that's an ad for someone else's movie? But when I was a kid, I mean, the Fantastic Four was the comic book. I mean, the world's greatest comic magazine they had on the cover, introducing the Silver Surfer, introducing the Inhumans. I mean, that was where the science fiction yep. happened. That was its top title, and we all loved it. And then it got boring, like, oh, those are the old establishment heroes, and oh, how do we make them interesting and everything? And then for a while, there was no Fantastic Four. They would not publish a Fantastic Four comic, and I know they've just begun again. Yeah. I have not read them. I am very interested in reading them to see if they could make them matter again. They might be impossible. Who knows? Maybe they can't pull it off and make that comic book matter the way it mattered for all of us because that's where Stan Lee and Jack Kirby were doing their best work. You know, the, you, know you go through the first 75 issues, let's say, and that was Marvel. That was Marvel at its best. You know, that and, of course... You know, Stan and Steve did go and lay driver me to Spider-Man, but to my mind, you know, that was the best of Marvel. So uh, that's a reboot that if you had asked me a year ago, I'd say, boy, I want to have that come back. I want them to do it again. I haven't read it to know if they – maybe you guys have read it already. I don't know. Did it just come out? What? Oh, uh, oh I don't know. How about you, Jay? Come on. You had to have read Fantastic Four, right? The, the Actually, new – no, no, I I boycott New Marvel. I've actually, I've gone back and started reading old Avengers and West Coast Avengers, and yeah. you just decide to live in nostalgia. I'm gonna live in nostalgia <laughs> till Marvel pulls his head out of its butt. He's say, like, "Rah, pa, pa, Marvel." Yeah. So, <laughs> all right, so, so, um, so, so before we before we jumped off, Mike, I was kind of hoping to get this. Is what I was typing to you, I was kind of hoping to ask one more thing about Captain Marvel, uh, before we before we went off the the, the rails with that, um. I, what I wanted to say was, so, so Scott, you were you were talking about uh, the old Captain Marvel and and, and all that, but Jay, uh, real quick, what what happened with Captain Marvel? How did, Carol Danvers became Captain Marvel? How did that right, happen? So, so if, for those of you who haven't read it, there's a there's a there was a trade paperback, the death of Captain Marvel, um, which is ironic because Captain Marvel was like my childhood hero who died of cancer, and then I got cancer a few years later. It was pretty freaking funny. Um, oh yeah, hilarious! Ha ha ha! <laughs> so, so, anyways, Nitro, and ironically enough, I got it from a chemical spill, and Nitro gassed Captain Marvel, so he dies. So, Carol Danvers, what happens is, um, she gets caught in an explosion with with Marvel, and she ends up getting his power, getting some type of power similar to his. Now, it depends on kind of how you read it. The original Captain Marvel, like Carol Danvers, had a suit. Like a kind of like what the what Iron Man has in the Infinity War, and what Spider the the nano suit type thing, right? Right. Um, so she had something like that, and then later she ended up, she got her her mind sucked or her power sucked or something by, where she ended up with residual powers from wearing the suit for a long time, and then eventually ends up getting Rogue's powers. It's kind of I don't know. It's Rogue gets her powers, she gets something. It's a cluster frick. So whatever they're doing it doesn't include the X Men or any mutants. So right. the the Carol Danvers you're gonna get is probably gonna be like the T'Challa, Black Panther esque, Iron Man esque nano tech suit more than like a traditional Captain Captain Marvel. Carol but she, Danvers. I thought she was gonna be coming in from the '90s though. Yeah, which means she is, yeah, the movie's gonna be a flashback with uh, yeah. Nick Fury with both yeah. eyes. Yeah, yeah, and I think. My understanding is is that they're gonna they're gonna treat it as if there was no Captain Marvel, or if there was, it's all gonna be backstory. That she's essentially gonna be this the cinematic universe's only real Captain Marvel that ever does anything in the cinematic universe. Is that is that what you think? Maybe. No, that's probably so, what's gonna happen. Well, right. there is a character in there. Uh, if you look at IMDb, by the name of Walter Lawson. Walter mm -hmm. Lawson was the name who the original Captain Marvel in the very first issue assumed the identity of this scientist who, if I'm remembering correctly, worked for AIM. Remember the advanced idea mechanics yeah. people? 
So I don't know whether that Walter Lawson, what it really means in the context of the movie, whether that will somehow be related to the original Captain Marvel or just that's the character who Captain Marvel assumed the identity of or what. So there is some kind of call out to the name that he took over in that first issue of Marvel Superheroes. But the, the thing that you were mentioning here, trying to make sense of all of these decades of, of comic bookdom, explains why it would be impossible to do what I did in terms of getting a job being hired at Marvel in 1974, because when I was hired to sit there and proofread comic books, I had read every single comic book that Marvel had published mm -hmm. from the, be you know, the beginnings of Spider-Man through that period. So that meant if I read an issue of Spider-Man in my head, I knew everything that ever happened, every twist and turn, who became a friend and then became an enemy and this, that, and the other. Right. I don't think you could hire someone today who in their head could say, I know internally everything and can <laughs> right. see whether this fits into canon or not. I don't know, Scott. It's Have possible. you seen some of these YouTubers out there? That yeah. All they do is they get, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not even going to make fun of them because there's a guy who I love to listen to. It's called Comics Explained. And I mean, he just, he can spout off all this stuff. And I know he does some um, pre-planning and, and um, back, you know, studies for his issues that he, he YouTubes, but man, it is there. There are there are people who are well versed. I will say that. But you're right. You, no one knows every plot from every storyline in every universe. I'm sure of that. Yeah. And also, the things that you read as a kid get under your skin the way other things yeah. don't. I mean, if you read the Fantastic Four again, if you read Fantastic Four number fifty, this man, this monster, you know, and think, oh, that's one of the greatest standalone Marvel comics ever. You don't forget that issue. I can close my eyes and see panels from that issue. Or, you know, Spider-Man. If you're of the right age to see Spider-Man trapped under the machinery, that three or four page sequence right. that Ditko yeah. did that we've all seen. If you read that when you're eight or nine years old, you know, that is with you forever. And there's no way reading a year of Spider-Man in your 40s is going to have the same effect on you internally as reading it when you're 10 years old. So you might intellectually be able to pull it all together, but I don't think it can emotionally touch you the same way. All right, we just had a really cool question in the chat room, and I want to say uh, that was a cool one, Spence. And I'm going to ask you this, Scott. Uh, what was your favorite villain to write and why? Ooh, my favorite villain of all of them. Uh, let's see. I have done so many different strange issues. I mean, you were holding up the one... Uh, of, uh, oh, was it, uh... Death Grip? Was that... Oops, was Jay that? likes Death no, Grip. <laughs> bizarrely, bizarrely, it is the villain I had in uh, the Omega the Unknown issue that I did, who is not the greatest villain in the world, is a character named Blockbuster. And the reason that I liked that so much is because the comics code intervened in something that was done in that issue, it made me change some of the villain uh, wow. and what was going on in the issue. Let me guess, he, over, he overcharged for movies. That's right, right yeah. that's right. The late, that's the late fee was, just late fees, yeah. it was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> All the, he did not rewind, that was a problem. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know? But, uh, but th this was a guy who was uh, just stealing to take care of his kid. You know, he needed the money because his kid needed to be taken care of. And at the very end of the issue, as he's running away, uh, he punches a cop and runs off, and once Omega the Unknown heard that he was doing it for his kid, he let the guy escape. Because he had that connection with what James Michael Starling, the kid he was watching, and the comics code came back and said, you can't have someone punch a cop at the end of an issue and go away. <laughs> with that, you have let evil triumph and go unpunished. Damn it! And, and I said, well, but next issue, he's going to be captured the next issue. Don't worry about it. And they said, no, no, you can't do that. So, uh, wow. so anyone who looks at the issue of Omega the Unknown I did, I think the next to the last panel, or the third from the last panel, uh, uh, Blockbuster is running away, and his fist is up in the air in a very strange way. <laughs> Nobody runs like that. Right. We're fighting out over him <laughs> while he's police and he was flying through the air after he was in punch. Oh, my gosh! Because so eventually said, well, is it okay if he gets away, but we just white out the policeman, so he's not punching the policeman, and they said, okay. So How about if he punched him but missed? <laughs> yeah, maybe Yeah, maybe that could happen. So I actually uh, scanned. I still kept the paperwork I had from the comics code and scanned and put it up on my blog for anyone who would actually want to see what the comics oh, code had to say about that. Awesome. But that was a fun issue, uh, and Jim Mooney, who drew Supergirl when I was a kid, 
Uh, again, saying the things that touched us when we were kids have more power. Uh, you know, there were artists like him and uh, Jim Mooney, uh, George Tusca, who did an issue of Captain Marvel. Uh, when I had a story at DC drawn by Ramona Fraden, who when I was a kid drew Metamorpho. Uh, those artists were so much more amazing to me than even the world's greatest artists of my own generation. You know, to be able to work with someone who influenced me when I was a kid. So, you know, th wow. those are just amazing people to have a chance to work with. God, I could talk to you about all this stuff all night long, but but we're we got to watch our time here, okay? So so, uh, uh, let me let me touch on a couple of things. We'll, we'll, we'll rapid fire these. So, welcome back, Carter, as a comic. How many how many ep episodes was that? I mean, for any of our fans who are not old as dirt like like me, uh, ooh, 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 right, right. How ooh, many? Ooh. <laughs> Mr. Welcome Cutter, back, Carter. Mr. Cutter. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. Welcome Brett, back, Carter. It was an awesome show in the 70s. I don't know if it made it into the 80s. I know it was in the 70s. Uh, it, it was a, He was a classroom teacher, and he had these knucklehead students. But but there was a comic, Welcome Back, Carter. I didn't even know this existed. How, uh, how long did that, that last? I think it only lasted 11 to 12 issues, and I only right. wrote a couple of them. But they were so easy to write, and I think the reason I was giving the assignment, because I was them. I was okay, those. Right. I, you were sweat I, hog. I from Brooklyn. <laughs> I grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, I was only a couple. I remember, I was doing this at 19 and 20, 21. Yeah, yeah, How far yeah. away was I from being a high school kid, from being right. an, an idiotic high school kid from Brooklyn? So I knew the ticks of those characters forward and backwards, and it was one of the easiest assignments that I've ever had because they just came out of me. And I, I want you to know that uh, every single page I ever wrote for Marvel Comics has since been reprinted, some of them multiple times. Not a single page I ever wrote for DC has ever been reprinted. Oh, my God. I don't know why no one wants to read those Welcome Back, Carter stories mm. anymore, but, you know, mm. what mm. can I say? But then, they, they were an awful lot of fun. And then you, you did some Weird War, ta Weird War Tales. I think that was DC, right? I, I liked DC, Weird yeah. War. House of Mystery, I, House of Secrets, uh, Madame Xanadu, uh, you know, Secrets mm. of Haunted House, uh, Weird War Tales, Time Warp. Uh, all of those five, six, seven, eight page short stories that which we were trying to do those great EC comics, not as well as they did it back when EC comics did those. If any of you guys are familiar with uh, the ones that Bill Gaines did with you know, Wally Wood and Frank Rosetta and Joe Orlando in, in the 50s, it ended up getting banned. It caused the creation of the Comics Code, Jack Davis, you know, those amazing comics. And we were just right. trying to do half as well what they did back right. then. Uh, and then but they. Oh, they were a lot say, of fun. As I was going through your 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 long list of of, of accomplishments, uh, one of the things that you worked on was uh, was Crazy Magazine, and I completely forgot about Crazy Magazine. I liked Crazy. I I loved Mad Magazine. I loved National Lampoon. I loved Crazy. And when I looked it up, I was like, "Holy crap!" I mean, talking about the stuff that sticks with you, I swear. I I had I didn't even know Crazy Magazine wasn't around anymore, and it hasn't been around since the '80s. Like oh, I didn't no. realize it had such a short run, and like I still remember it. Like it's you know like like it was a real thing. You know, I mean it was a real thing, but I mean like like as if it was it was more than what it was. And and I came across a uh, two of the things I came across nice about a, a Crazy Magazine was uh, there was a Flash Gordon episode. Which that's awesome, uh, Flash. That, that's a theme with me on this show. Uh, and then I noticed there was an Abinoxo the Clown. Now, did he come from Crazy Magazine? Because I, he was in a. Uh, they they did this weird crossover with with X Men and Abinoxo, uh, which was weird. He's like this dirty like like I don't know, like like your dirty uncle clown or something like your dirty alcoholic uncle clown. Um, did he come from Crazy Magazine? I believe that was in there. Now, is this pronounced Obnoxio? I can't remember. Or maybe it's Obnoxio. You're probably right. Yeah, you're probably right. If I'm remembering correctly, that was created by, was it Alan Kupperberg and Larry Hama? I don't remember for sure. But, you know, that was in Crazy. But I ended up writing some fake ads for Crazy. Right. Uh, you know, one of which uh, had Stanley burning money, a subscription ad in the back. And we got the pose holding up. You know, $100 bills while he was lighting them on fire, lighting a cigar with these flaming $100 bills. So I like the fact that I wrote an ad in the back so that Stan Lee could burn, could light his cigars with your burnt money. Wow. Um, and, uh, but the, one of the best things I did, and I appeared in an ad that Steve Gerber wrote, uh, which you may have seen the photo of me looking like a kung fu guy with a big beard. Um, yeah. 
there, there was a comic book that ad that would appear there, uh, Count Dummy. No, Count, I don't remember the real ad anymore. I know the spoof ad was Count Dummy. It was a guy who would teach you to rip people's hearts out and, uh, and protect yourself on it. They always had these kung fu ads in the comic books. And oh, yeah, Steve like Gerber, kick sand in your face. You, yeah, you, yeah and right. Steve Gerber did a spoof of it, and they had me pose in a strange kung fu uh, position wearing a gi or something. So I, it looked like I was ripping someone's heart out, and I had a you know, big Rasputin beard and long hair back then. Uh, and so I was in the inside back cover of Crazy dressed like that. So... Uh, it was, and Steve Gerber is the one who was editing that back then. And he was really just a, a genius who not as many people remember these days, his Howard the Duck and Man thing. And what he was doing is crazy, trying not to just be a mad magazine light, which was often what cracked, uh, what he, tr he tried to go in a different way, not be the National Lampoon, not be Mad Magazine, but be something uh, in the middle. Right, right. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, also, uh, you, you've written like a ton of, of horror and science fiction. Um, and one of the things you, you had mentioned that, that I think is funny is it said, you said it took you 44 years to sell the story to analog. Um, and that, was that a science fiction or a horror story? That was a science fiction story. Analog is one of the oldest magazines that's been around. Uh, I think it's in its 75th or 80th year or something. I sent it my first one in 1972 when I was 16 years old and I've been sending him a couple of stories a year since then and it got to the point where I said you know I want to sell him a story not even to be in the magazine I want to sell a story to tell people never give up don't surrender your dreams so when I sold one in 2018 I did a post on that I still had my original rejection letter from 1972 so it was 44 years and three editors later I finally sold him a story and then I sold him another one six months later Nice. So uh, okay. it, it was just pretty amazing, uh, you know, to have broken through because I believe if people enjoy doing it, they whether they sell or they don't sell, it's never give up, never surrender, as they say in Galaxy Quest. Right. So you're so yes, yeah. it's it's seventy two and you're selling a story, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Hey Pete, you know what I was doing in seventy two? What's that? I was sliding out of my mother's vagina. And this guy, <laughs> oh, oh, Jesus. Right. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, how about that? I was crazy. I, <laughs> look at Jay. <laughs> All right, so, sorry. So, and before we got, we got a game. We're going to do a quick game. But before that, we got oh, one more thing. It's embarrassing, I know. No, Something no. bad's going to happen with this game. I can no, tell. No, 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 no. Don't worry no, about when it. When the game starts, I'm going to go, gee, is this mute button on again? I don't right. know what happened. <laughs> can you mute me again? <laughs> All right. So no, but before we do that, we we yeah, can't. We one more thing. We got one more thing. We can't leave without you mentioning your show. You have a you have a podcast called Eating the Fantastic. Tell people about that real quick. I do have a podcast. You don't get to see it because that would really be disgusting. But right, I, right. I, that I, would not be good. I, I am known for the guy in science fiction fandom and horror fandom where a great place to eat is. So when it came time to do a podcast, I said I don't just want to be another interview show. There are a million of them. What's the yeah. shit going to be? What's going to make it be a little different? So I said, I'm going to take somebody out to breakfast, lunch, or dinner. We're going to pin on clip-on mics, and I'm going to interview you while we have a meal. And you're eavesdropping because my first convention was when I was 15 years old. And going at lunch or dinner with someone is as much fun as me at the convention when you grab friends and yeah. go somewhere and just you know shoot the breeze. So I yeah. said, that's what the podcast is going to be. You're just pulling up at the table while we talk and eat about science fiction or horror or how to write comics. I had Marv Wolfman on the show talking about the old days. Uh, you know, I marvel in D.C. and he broke in. I did an episode with George R. R. Martin where we talked about his early days of comics fandom and stuff like that. So it's just a different kind of an interview show, and uh, people seem to like it. So 70 episodes out so far. It's called Eating the Fantastic, and you just look for it on the iTunes store or go to eatingthefantastic.com, and you could have lunch or dinner with me. Fantastic. All right. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Everybody, we're going to uh, let me let me get. Oh, you know what I got to do first? This and then then this. No, 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 no. Oh, well. Check out Scott Edelman. Uh, S C O T T E D E L M A N dot com. Uh, find him on Twitter uh, at uh, at Scott Edelman. Uh, um, and that's the only two links I have for you. Any uh, any other links you want to give out? Uh, find him. You know, you can find Eating the Fantastic on your favorite podcatcher. Just search it. Uh, go to your podcatcher and search it, and you'll find it. It comes comes right up. It's the only one. So check out Scott's stuff. Yeah, Twitter stuff. is the main home if people want to see what I'm doing. So. Oh, also, oh, so your Twitter is your place. That's that's. Where I consider really... that it's more than Facebook. Stuff okay. gets reprinted, republished, and ported over to Facebook. But you know, Twitter is really where I you know hang out and shoot the breeze, okay. and if people want do, to reach me. 
Do you control your Twitter? I do. Okay. Yeah, I think earlier I tried to friend you. I don't know if we uh, – or follow you. I don't know if we connected or not yet. No, he, he recognized uh, who you were and <laughs> – uh, <laughs> I, I immediately blocked and muted you. Yeah. <laughs> Just like on this show, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm never going to live that down. I, You know that, Mike? I'm never, ever going to live that down. Is that a first? Down. Can I say that That's, is a first yes, for the show? Yes, that is absolutely After a first. Five years. I, I, have, I have muted people on purpose, but I have never accidentally muted anyone. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've muted Mike. Yeah. He has show up before a show, and I hate um, – I hate when he eats when I'm trying to get stuff ready, and he's like crunch, 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 and I'm like, dude, stop! Because <laughs> he does it on purpose. He overdoes it. Yeah, I, mean, I may like to do a little uh, Tom Fullery once in a while. And, and then he goes, he, goes, <sighs> I'm like, stop! <laughs> all right, anyway, anyway, all right, let's let's do this game. Let's go. Ha! Huh? All right, everybody, it's game time with the Mythwits. I am your game master, Peter Bryant, and tonight we are playing a, a version of this or that. Uh, I don't have a fancy name for the game. I, I, I really tried to come up with one, but it's basically, is this a bizarre Marvel hero or a bizarre DC hero? So all you got to tell me, I'm going to give you a name. Oh, and so are we competing you... on this, or is this all on me? Is this a whole game? No, no, it's a compete. It's a, it's a compete. Oh, we're all so competing. We're all competing. Um, it's mostly going to be guessing, unless you are really a savant, because I picked some really weird uh, uh, characters. Some are heroes, some are villains. Um, I just so picked some really... Shout out which company it is. That's a... Yeah, that's all you got to do. So, uh, and I'm not even putting the scrub. I'm just going to write it down on my thing, because uh, I, I was a little unprepared tonight. Uh, so I'm going to, let's start with, let's do this one. We'll start with Mike, uh, being that he's the, the, the co-host and, uh, the we'll most show ignorant. You. Yeah, most oh, ignorant. so we shut up, but you're going to tell us yeah. who's, okay. Yeah. I'll give the name and then Mike has to guess and he, if he gets it right, I gets a point. If he gets it wrong. You mean when he gets it wrong? When he gets, no, nah, it's 50, 50, man. You got, you know, it's oh, DC or Marvel. You got, yeah. you could flip a coin, right? I could. All right. So Mike, your yes. first one. Devil Dinosaur. Devil Dinosaur. Oh, you know that one. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> That's cute. Yeah, I know that one. Yeah. I'm sure you know that one. Oh, sure. Everyone knows that it's Marvel. Is that your guess? Yeah, sure. Why not? Mike, that is correct. Devil oh, Dinosaur yes. is... A is a red dinosaur similar to a Tyrannosaurus rex that was born on an alternate Earth. He has spent somewhat of a telepathic link to a Neanderthal named Moon Boy. Moon Boy. Woohoo! All right, so you knew that one. Okay. And the bonus question is who created the devil dinosaur? Oh, I don't know. Who's, who's that? Jack Kirby. Jack. Oh, it was a Jack Kirby. Okay. When he came and back after having left. Oh, wow. All right. Well, well I would I like to take this time to point out that that was a great example of statistics. <laughs> no, you knew it. I could see no, on your face. You see no, no, I'm a good actor. Is what yeah. I am. You knew it. All right, so so Jay, yours is anthro. Anthro. Well, oh, it's gonna be DC, I think. Is that your guess? Yeah, that's my guess. I would agree. That is correct, Jay. Look, you guys are doing great. Created by Anthro. <laughs> <laughs> We're first, look at this. Oh, Scott's going to crush you guys. All right, all right so no, Anthro... No, I'm going to get one that I won't know at all. I knew both right. of yours. I'm going to get them. Right. No, this is Scott's new rule. He has to tell you who wrote it, too. Yeah, right. No, 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 no. I'm not doing that. All right, so Anthro is a Cro-Magnon boy whose greatest weapon is his quick mind and his ability to show compassion for an enemy. That's his weapon? Okay. Anyway, all right, so Scott... Scott, yours is... Now, watch. He's not going to know this watch, one. Watch. I'm not going to know yeah. this one. Man. All right. Rainbow Raider. Rainbow did, Raider. Did he create this one, though? No, I did not create one. This, <laughs> now, this is embarrassing because this is going to almost be a guess. I'm hey, gonna, hey, you got 50-50 shot like I did. Hey, you, you can know. do elimination. <laughs> I, I'm going to get this one wrong because I'm going to say DC. DC. That is correct. I would have gone with DC on that yeah. one too. Yeah, well, so you could do eliminate. You could do process of elimination. You could say Marvel wouldn't come up with a name that dumb, and then <laughs> that has to be no, a DC the name. I wasn't sure. Is I couldn't remember who created it, and I said if I can't remember who got created it, I must not be a hundred percent sure. Uh, okay. All right. Well, Rainbow Raider is DC is an an artist 
who turned to crime when the world rejected his artistic genius due to his color blindness. <laughs> what? I don't know. I don't know. All right, Mike. Mike, your next one. Okay. Awesome Android. Awesome Android. That really sounds DC. DC, your guess? DC is my final answer. Uh, uh, yeah. Mike. No, you're in your final answer. You're done. <laughs> Mike, that was the, see, 50 50 uh, chance, right? You got one right going wrong. All right, so Awesome Android is a synthetic. Buddy, adaptive... I didn't get the buzzer. I want the buzzer, and I want the buzzer right now. I did it. Did you hear a buzzer? I didn't hear a buzzer. I heard a buzzer. All right. Anyway, Awesome Android, a synthetic adaptive Android designed by the Mad Thinker to combat superheroes, although later defected and becoming a, an employee of Goodman, Lieber, Kurtzberg, and Holloway. Was it a law firm? Did he become a lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> that definitely sounds like a law firm. It does. Yes. All right, Jay. Oh, by the I way, I have, I have the awesome Android Heroclix figure. So. Do you really? Oh, my God. All right. <laughs> All right, so Jay. That's a great thing. Super hip. Super hip. Oh, I want to say DC because I, I would hope Marvel wouldn't, wouldn't go down there. But <laughs> See, process of elimination. Oh, I could be wrong. <laughs> process of elimination does work. Uh, super hip. And he's, oh, he's I like, think I know. The, is this Bob Hope? I don't know. It's, it's, it's uh, due to a never – all right. Due to a never show experiment – Whenever genius teenager Tad Waller Jute Fruits Jute Fruits loses his temper, his fist turns green, then spins like a tornado and transforms into a hipster who calls himself Super Hip. Hmm. No wait, 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 wait. Who? who uh, which I missed the the. So technically, I cheated because I looked at Scott who was smiling. So I knew I had to go in the right direction. That's fine, man. Play the audience. Wait, wait a minute. What, what is it? What is it? Was that DC or? That was DC. Okay, that sounds DC. I swear, like when you, if you give us the, oh, that's a, that'd be a good game, Pete, sidebar. Is this power, DC power or a Marvel yeah. power? Because DC always oh, had the strangest powers. Do that. All right. All right, okay. so Scott, you're up. Okay. Papa Midnight. Papa Midnight. I'm going to say Marvel. Marvel. Scott, I'm sorry. That is a DC. Oh. Linton Midnight is a powerful voodoo priest and sorcerer. His le uh, he leads a brutally violent street gang and is and is covenant I didn't write these. Is in covenant as the most deadly sorcerer in all of Manhattan. Midnight is both a sometimes ally and enemy of John Constantine. Oh, so he must boy. come from the yeah, Constantine. I thought that was a Luke Cage villain. It sounds like it does sound like a Luke Cage villain. Very, do, very much does. All right, Mike. Or brother Voodoo. Or brother Voodoo, right? Uh, Mike Black Talon. Black Talon. Oh, crap. Oh, see, I don't know this, but I'm gonna say that if it was, and I don't know the comics that well, so if it is a Marvel one, then it would obviously be in the Black panther universe but i don't think it is i think it is like a a bad guy in the dc universe because that's what they would do is they would take they would flip bad guys for good guys and steal them their names mm -hmm. or at least their power so i'm gonna go with dc on this one dc okay well then uh you're, you're gonna get wrong. that wrong. <laughs> yeah. i don't get a buzzer i don't hear it why this what? I, feel I don't know why you're not hearing it everybody else is i'm hearing it fine well, can yeah. somebody please uh, give me an onomatopoeia I mean, or something? Hold on, Mike. Can you? Do you I don't have hear a buzzer around here. You guys need a buzzer. Mike, you don't hear this. <laughs> I'm leaving here. Nope. You're not hearing that. <laughs> no. All right. Well, I, I'm sorry, buddy. Okay. All right. Let's so anyway. See <laughs> so uh, yeah. So Black Talon derives his power from the mystic voodoo arts. He can raise. <laughs> Uh, you know what? I actually have that one on my on my shelf here. Oh, what, Black nice. Talon? No. Oh, it's Derm. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. This is crazy. <laughs> we have the same thing hanging on our thing. Yeah, Jay, right. Jay, you're up. Your I am. Yes. Max Robo. Max Robo. Oh, that's DC. DC is. 
Scott, you must be having one of these, right? <laughs> oh, Lordy. You see that? Yes. Wow. Awesome. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. That's crazy. <laughs> All right. So I, I would just like to point out that Jonathan in the chat room doesn't hear the buzzer either. Thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan, Jonathan go, go, go make Wargaming podcasts. How is he not hearing it? How is that, that possible? That, 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 I, I, I'm right. You're wrong. Let's go. Uh, whatever. All right, so Max <laughs> Robo is a man with cybernetic implants and a future enemy of Damian Wayne. All right, Scott, you're up. Okay. Crimson Commando. Oh, that's a good one. Crimson Commando. Oh. Oh, I know what I would say. You know what you would say, but would you say it? Crimson <laughs> Commando. <laughs> oh, it'd be a complete guess, but I know what I would say. <laughs> I'm going to say DC. DC. Oh, I'm sorry, Scott. Oh, not good. It's Can I can at, I explain this one? Sure, go ahead. It was a it was in the X-Men comics after a 2 issue 212 or 213 or whatever. So probably probably after, right after you left Marvel. It was during the right after the, the Mutant Massacre run. But he was uh, a He was like wasn't he like a World War 2 Yep. World War II ve veteran superhero uh, trio of World War II super veteran superheroes recruited to be a member of Freedom Force, the original government-sponsored mutant team. With Blockbuster, which is when you mentioned Blockbuster earlier, Scott, I was like, wait a second, is that going to be the same one? Or You know what? I was tying a Crimson Commando together with one of those Roy Thomas 1940s World War II books that he did for DC. That's where I was thinking it came from. All those World War II books must have blended together. Oh, it could be. could be. Well, I would... I <laughs> You didn't want me to cheat for you because I would have said DC as well. All right, so Mike, here I go. Is Hyperman. Hyperman. Oh, DC, DC, without a doubt, DC, DC, DC all the way, DC. That yeah, is correct. Hey, I'm correct. Hyperman with origins similar to Superman, he was rocketed from his dying homeworld of Zoran to the planet Oceana, where he is found and adopted by loving parents, the Kings. As with Superman, he would become the greatest hero in his new home. Hey, this may come as a surprise to you, but I guess that one too. Okay, good, good. All right, <laughs> Jay. Porcupine yeah. Pete. Porcupine Pete. Oh, Porcupine. that's a Porcupine Pete or, or Porcupine, because Porcupine is in is in Marvel. Okay. So I don't know. I'm gonna. I'll go with Marvel. That is correct. Peter Durston, a metahuman from the 30th century, uh, with quill-like gross all over his body, was rejected by the Legion of Superheroes and instead joined the Legion of Substitute Heroes. Wait, there that's was a the, Legion. Oh, no, 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 that's, that's DC, dude. Hold on. There's a, por there's a porcupine in Marvel, and there's also a porcupine. Okay, so there must be two porcupines then. Hold on. Do I have to look this up? Because I, I pulled this look from this look. I pulled this from a website, so I don't know. Um, porcupine Pete. Is there a Porcupine Pete Marvel? No, it's going to be Porcupine Marvel. So I was wrong. So. Oh, okay. I. You know what? My bad. I. I that's weird. Okay, I thought it was Marvel, but sorry, Jay. You that's don't get okay. That at least, I, at least I still remember who the real Porcupine is. Right. So. Hey, that's good, man. Thank you. Thank you for catching that. Uh, all right. So Scott, last one. You get the last go. Oh boy. Uh, yours is Unicorn. Unicorn. I would say Ooh. that's a Marvel. That's a Marvel. Yes. Milo's yeah, Marasic. Got to know the powers. Come on, break it. But what are the powers? Jay, you seem to know this one. Do you know this one? You could fire like some energy beam from his horn. It was. It was actually a pretty freaking cool, cool villain too. Yeah, he's something about he wears technology stolen from Dynamo, so I guess he's like one of the powered armor guys. I think he went up against. Did he was he in that armor series with uh, Iron Man, the like armor, the Armor Wars? No, he, was, he wasn't in Armor Wars. Okay. All right. Well, hey, you know what that means? That means that uh, Jay, you're our winner. <laughs> I never win anything. <laughs> can you can you hear this music? No. No. That's weird. No, no not you, I Mike. Can... All right, never mind. For some reason, the music isn't working for my well, thing. It's That's interesting. Odd. So are you hearing it's this music, Jay? It's showing up everywhere. Actually, K-Face, <gasps> I've been messing with you the whole show. I can't hear a thing. I can't oh, hear. Oh, you know why? No, I don't know why. I don't know. I'll have to figure it out. I don't know. I'll have to figure it out. I don't know what the hell's going on because I can hear it 
the audience can hear it because it was showing up on the or maybe they can't hear it. I don't know. Anyway, I can hear it. So there's that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean everyone in the everyone in the chat room has come to the conclusion that yes, I am not crazy for okay, this fine. Reason. But for other reasons, I'm still well, crazy. Well, Jay, you know what? Jay was skewing me on that because if he said that he wasn't, he said he was hearing it. So that meant that, uh, whatever. Anyway. Jay's about as reliable check, check as, your, as check a... Check your text messages, Blix. I texted you about Dude, that I one. can't. I can't look at text messages while I'm doing this show. I've got five windows open. I'm controlling all kinds of I'll software just... here. I was just messing with KFAS. There was no that's sound fine. dude the entire show, man. All right, great. that's fine. That's fine. We'll fix it later. All right, so anyway, Scott, thanks for being on the show. We really appreciate it. You have to come back sometimes. I mean, we, we hit like, I don't know, like two-thirds of what we could have talked about. Uh, we yeah. could have you come on and talk about comics again, anything, whatever. Oh, definitely. Science fiction. Probably, you can ask me one question. I can fill a whole hour. I could just yeah, yeah. Um, I, I see that. Cut me off. Yeah. We'll bring burritos. You'll leave a burrito, and we'll have a meal. We'll eat burritos. That's right. That's right. And I already signed your comics. Okay. That's right. There you go. You know, we have to I do. Know. Mike, you know, we have to do. We have to get. We have to get Scott. Jim Beal and and Jack Clemens on at the same time. Get all you guys on, and we'll talk. We'll just talk science fiction. And science. That, that'll be fun. That, that'd be a good idea, I think. Yeah. But, um, Let me know. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, everybody. Let's do this. All right. You've just enjoyed another awesome episode of The Mythwits. And you got to see me do a totally epic fail and screw the game up. Oh, and my sounds weren't working. So this was really good. Uh, we're live on Facebook Mondays, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Please ask our guests questions or just banter with the other Mythfits. Uh, if you miss our live show, you can always catch the Encore episodes on Facebook or YouTube. Find us at Mythwits.com and on Facebook, Twitter. And YouTube is The Mythwits. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcatcher. Uh, thank God it's working again. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate and make sure to share your favorite episode on social media to help spread Mythwits love over the entire planet. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Like and share it in all the places. Just don't edit it, don't sell it, and don't submit it to Analog or else you still won't be published. Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. Uh, check out TSRPN.com for more cool shows. And Game School is coming back, baby. We're already recording, we're recording episodes uh, in August. It's going to launch I'm gonna in, in the next couple weeks. I'm going to be posting all the, the ones from Season 1 that, that we didn't finish. So hang in there. Go check it out. Uh, check and out our TSRP. New host, our new host is? Oh, yeah. Our new host is uh, James Carpio. Our hosts James Carpio and uh, Spence. Um, she's been in the chat room, so yeah, they do. They did a great job. I listened in on the first one, uh, and it was it was fantastic. Anyway, so uh, blah, 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 where were we? Oh, uh, yeah. Anyway, thanks everybody for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. Until next week, Mike. I got nothing, man. I got no sound. I got no sound. You got no. All What's right. the frequency, Kenneth? What's the <laughs> frequency? All right, everybody. Thanks. See you later. Excelsior. <laughs> oh, good one. Nice, nice ending on. This.